that is that what you want us to say? <laughs> haters, haters everywhere. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> well, is this the part where I acknowledge that your iPhone or whatever I nonsense you are using is working? Because your camera quality has gotten significantly better. If I tell you what I'm using, you're going to be angry. So maybe I shouldn't say it. It cannot be anything Android, is it? I'm using an iPhone six. It's okay. Yeah, let's done. No, 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 no. That's okay. <laughs> Take back my compliment. How dare you just iPhone six? The one is iPhone. I even know there's iPhone thirteen. So, that one I know. I, that one I know. I take no, it back. No, so so basically, no, basically, I have this app that lets you use your phone as your webcam, um, and you can get like a cheap. So I just got like a cheap iPhone six to use as a dedicated webcam. Basically, well, I'm talking about iPhone. I don't care about iPhone. I don't want to have this conversation. <laughs> Am I frozen as well? By the way, you'll be frozen since Elsa will never recognize you anymore. Wow, that, that wow. was a good that, joke. That was low. <laughs> that was low. I, I, I don't know why I laughed. Why? If I not laugh, you're I mean, myself laughed. Do you know how rare yeah. that is? <laughs> yeah, throttling. <laughs> it was so wild. Oh my gosh, I'm the best ever. Oh I'm back. No, oh, thanks. I don't see you, but I think it's just as oh well. I think God. let's take your face because I don't know. It's like we can't have it talk. Ooh, she's That's back with the video. <laughs> Oh in, God. In, in can you hear full, me? In full yeah. color and audio, yes. I can, can see you. I can hear you. See and hear you. <laughs> and your audio Perfect. is... Perfect. Chef's kiss. <laughs> Thank God. Finally. Okay. I hope to, I know this short exercise. Finally. Just to that Apple is just one of the biggest corruptors of the world. And we should do away with it. That's just the moral of this whole story. <laughs> see... Tolani, you know what I always say to you? Everyone has their flaws. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome to the More Civil Podcast. This is a podcast for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them. I am Mo, and I am your host, ready to spark your curiosity as I take you on this adventurous ride of exploring cultures through the stories of my guests from all over the world. On this show, we get really personal, discussing salient issues that are relevant to our contemporary age and also building community around them. As our guests exercise courage and vulnerability in sharing their life's experiences, we hope that in turn, you are inspired by them and that you get the courage in it to set your own stories free. Enjoy the ride. And thank you so much for listening. Anyways, um, welcome back everyone to the show. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still jet lagged. Um, whatever that mini so. version of traveling is. Hello everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Mo and I will be day, and that needs to be the official intro. I think that's it. That's all you guys have to know because. Look at that original, you know. <laughs> I mean, Ayomide is kind of like drawn in a very long way, so that way you can know it's Ayomide. Well, um, today we have a mutual friend on the show, best believe it. And we both went to college together. Um, some of you listening to this might know her, some of you might not, but by the end of this conversation, you're going to know a lot about our guest. Um, she's a poet and a writer. She has written three poetry books so far. One called Scarcast, the other one, The Calligraphy of God. And she just released her new book, a third book, How to Dance in Time. Um, She started writing poetry at an early age, and it has been, you know, her sole passion. She has written over 500 poems since her childhood. She loves to write, and through the years, she has, you know, shared some of her work on social media. On Instagram right now, she's at, you know, Poet Misery. No, Poet at Misery, like, you know, Poet and Misery. And she has over 64,000 followers, which is, I think is, you know, really bossy. We're going to tag all of her social media handle in the show notes, so go check them out. In her spare time, she, you know, likes to read, she likes to dance, and she loves watching The Office. I follow her on WhatsApp, so a lot of her status sometimes is just screenshots of conversations of, like, series that she's watching. So I know she's a true Office fan. And her hope one day is to live in a house by the sea. With ten dogs and write a hundred books. That's very, very specific. Everyone, please join me in welcoming or join us in welcoming Jenny DBA to the podcast. Hello. Hi. Specific. I need to know the order. I need to know the order of those hopes. 
Is so that, it's, it's, a house, house, then, it's a house oh, by the sea. And then, and then the dogs will come. But there's no pickle fence. There's no white pickle fence. So get around. I write 100 books. Not 99 books. Not 105 books. 100 books. <laughs> Uh, also, yes. do the books before you move into the house count? <laughs> I, I, I need to ask an important question. Be careful how you answer that question. You're going to be psychoanalyzed and judged. Because <laughs> this is a psychiatrist coming out in him. That's why oh I... Johnny, please, please the fifth right now. <laughs> in just that order, you know, the, the house first, no picket fences, then the dogs come in. And then write the books. books. Continue all through yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. Well, um, uh, really nice to have you. And I know that this is a story that I think whatever I'm going to talk about today is something that I know has been, I mean, it's coming on for a long time. So thank you for doing us the honors of coming on the show. Thank you thank so you much. much. Yes, yes. So I was just thinking about it like, I don't even really call you by your first name, I call you by Jenny. So maybe we can just start by that. Like, how did you come about Jenny, man? What was it like just, you know, growing up as a whole? Maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, how you grew up and what does, how did Jenny become just, you know, I know I can imagine it's Jenny for and then, I mean, paying like a, a homage to your Igbo side, but, you know, just tell us a little bit about just your glory. Okay. So, um, my, but let me start with the name, then I go to my childhood. So the name came about like in Medilac, in my medical school. So my roommate and best friend um, noticed like I love to wear jeans a lot. So she's denim. So she now started calling me Jenny. <laughs> so but my birth name is Jennifer. Then like another variation is when you say Jenny, it says like my Jenny, my Jennifer, something like that. So those two came together and Jenny became my pen name and that's what I'm known for. A lot of people don't know who Jennifer Duvier is. They just know who Jennifer Duvier is. And uh, then for my childhood, I was born in Wari, Nigeria. And uh, I um, I was the second in a family of four. And um, my brother, I have one brother, t- two sisters. So uh, I'm the first girl. And growing up in Wari was crazy, but very fun and interesting. So, like, everyone knows about Worry. Worry is a crazy people, <laughs> a crazy place to grow up, basically. And because of, like, the, you know, that's where the Niger Delta is, the um, oil. So, of course, there are lots of crises and different things. But I had a beautiful childhood. And uh, I think my dad got transferred to Lagos in 1999. So our entire family moved to Lagos. And then my life changed. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you've told us about you've told us about your your dreams, your wanting to get live in the house by the sea, and you know the ten dogs and the hundred books. And I really want to sit with that because there's so much there. But there's there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot more to you. So and and we need to we need to talk about that. Um, okay. One of the things about you that I know we're going to spill, spend time on is the fact that you. And I think this is how I first knew you, is that you love to write um, and you love to read. Um, yeah. And we're going to get into that. But before we get into that, um, tell us tell us something about you that Tolane and I don't know and that perhaps many people don't know about you. Something, something that people tend to be surprised by when they discover. Okay. Um, so... I grew up like being a very shy kid, but as a teenager, the first thing I did was I joined the choir. So I was part of the choir, me and my sister, my immediate younger sister. Then after that, I was the head of a dance group. So we used to go out and perform on stage <laughs> at different concerts and churches. Is there like a video clip of that anywhere on YouTube that we can watch? <laughs> yeah. My sister here, me, maybe not. <laughs> so we, we love dancing. Like we prefer dancing so much more than school that my dad became extremely worried and banned us from dancing. <laughs> We're so passionate about dance. We loved it so much and wanted to become professional dancers, you know. 
And my dad was like, what? You know, if you have a Nigerian parent, you know what I'm talking about. So no way you're going to be a doctor. And you're going to be, you know, all the professional things you should be. And so for me, it brought my dancing career to an halt. But my sister was like way more stubborn. And she kept on dancing secretly. <laughs> so even in med school, so she became a doctor. She danced all over Lagos and outside Lagos, and <laughs> she danced her life away. And she gonna say, I think I remember the <laughs> dancing. Yeah, yes. was she yeah. the yeah. okay. um, dancing group, right? Yes, she was. Gospel on stage or whatever yeah. they used to do. Yeah, she was. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we. Well, shout out, out to together. Mildred. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that was that's actually a fun fact. I didn't know that about you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there's something you said earlier on about how you you were you were shy as a kid, and I know even in, in our conversation, I know what there's something you used to describe yourself like I'm painfully shy, and but your the way you write, anyone picking up your book, you don't get to see that because it's almost like you have a different persona through your words. So I guess my question would be, um, I, 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 maybe I would never even ask, ask this question a lot better than I would do justice to it, is your shyness, was it something that was just how you were or did something make a change? And I believe that you've also maybe evolved since then. You're not maybe not quite as shy because you, you're doing more stuff now. I, I guess my, my question is just really, talk a little bit about your shyness and how you've been able to get a lot of things done despite, you know, um, this attribute of yours. Okay, so... Um... I like to believe, like, maybe since I was my mom's, you know, stomach, I was already, like, shy. I believe I was kind of born shy, but um, the environment I grew up in kind of, uh, uh, maybe, what I say, exasperated it, made it more pronounced because I wasn't really allowed to have a voice, like, to speak. So if someone kind of hurt you or annoyed you, you were meant to kind of swallow it and accept it and keep quiet about it, you know? So I just grew to um, kind of retreat into my shell a lot, you know? And um, I never, the rest of my siblings are ultra confident, <laughs> overconfident even, you know, they are bold and they are, you know, they kind of, dominate their world. For me, I'd always been that child that was just extremely quiet and not outgoing. And um, even though like maybe people wanted to be my friends, I didn't know how to communicate with them or socialize with them. And um, then of course, I didn't know what introvert meant and all those other you know, terminologies. And um, so, but I kind of went through a lot in my life that I never thought I would go through. So I needed to find a way to let it out, you know, let out the things I was thinking but couldn't say and let out the pain and the, you know, basically my life journey, just let out a way to release, you know, the pressure of life. And at the age of 13 or 14, I found my voice through poetry. So everything I wanted to say but could not say, I could say it in a metaphor, you know, where people could see but not really know okay it's not explicit that she's saying this you know so you can draw your own conclusion from it and so poetry became kind of my lifeline oh wow that's so beautiful <laughs> and just imagine <laughs> not having that voice I, this is why i really believe in you know i i strongly advocate for like art, art programs like in schools and you know just giving ch children especially you know the opportunity to be able to express themselves Especially when you've gone through some things, and we're not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, do that thing of being ultra curious to find out what how your childhood was like. But I can definitely relate, like being able to write stuff, and you know, I'm just gonna write about my life in a way. But like a third person, and yeah. if you want to look at me and think it's me, that's fine. But whatever, I'm writing anyway. So, but yeah. thanks for sharing that. That's you know. Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I definitely want to. I want to know a bit more about that bit where you said you found your voice through poetry. Yeah. Um, can you unpack that? Like, what, what, okay. what was the? Is there a story there? Yes. You know, did <laughs> did you read did you read a poem in your life? Like, what happened? What what was the magic here? Okay. 
So um, all my life, I'd been like a science student. All of my family were all kind of science students, apart from my parents, they were arts, but they wanted their children to be science students. So we're heavily into the sciences. So I did not study poetry or know anything about poetry, literature, books, and all that. It wasn't a part of my childhood. My parents never kind of brought books to the home, but we brought up a lot on music and movies, but not books. So what just happened was that... Um, I don't know if I should say this, but like I kind of uh, suffered a lot of verbal abuse. So it was a lot. So whenever the, I was that child, like my other siblings, like, or other people, verbal abuse meant nothing to them. Maybe physical abuse would be more, you know, um, hardcore to them. But to me, it was the opposite. Verbal abuse was what was hardcore to me. So it was actually like crushing my spirit and it would make me more shy and retreat points to myself. So I had a lot of verbal abuse. And at some point, I accepted like every negative thing someone said about me. So everything they said, and uh, I think maybe especially from my parents. So whatever they said, I believed them that that was what I was. Whatever negative words they used to describe me, I believed them. And I wrote it down. I am this, I am that. That was how I said, right? That's the weirdest thing. So I just kept writing down every negative thing they said I was. And I said that that was who I was and what I was. And I had like, filled, you know, this long, I think they call it higher education book, (laughs) filled with words. The brown (laughs) one, right? That That was long, brown. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, wow. oh my god it was memories crazy. yeah so much you know and at some point i just started writing it like in lines i had no idea of any poet i didn't know what poetry was or meant you know mm. and but i was just writing my thoughts in lines so come to 2011 where facebook was now all that and everything so i start posting my poems i don't know if you remember there used to be like a note section on facebook oh yeah my gosh <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I used to put my work in the, One of in the, the many notes. things in the Facebook graveyard. Yeah. I can't even go back. If I look at the things I wrote, I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> People write this crap. But hey, we don't hate the good old days. This is how it started. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. So when I posted, they were like, oh, nice poem. And I was like, what's a poem? You know? And I went to Google and I was like, okay, what's a poem? What's poetry? And I started Googling. And spending days on Wikipedia, you know, reading the stories of poets like John Keats, you know, and their life story and things like that. And I was like, oh, wow. And I would read their poems. I will just like Google top 100 poems and I'll see Maya Angelou and all that. I was like, wow, this is beautiful. You know, <laughs> so this is what I'm doing. And that's how I got into poetry. That is wow. amazing. So basically, yeah. <laughs> you discovered poetry Poetry discovered you in a sense is yes. what you're, I'm hearing. Like you were you were getting into it before you even knew what it was. You were getting yes. into it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to add not to like yeah, I agree, I mean, not to like minimize the things we went through as a child, but your story reminds me of just, you know, that part of the Bible that says all things work together for good. Like the same sensitivity that made you absorb what people said around you to mean that's my identity was what you used to like drive your poetry. And here we are today. So I guess the moral of the story is, well, let's be very careful the words we say to, you know, little children. Because one, a child might listen to something and they might not think much of it. Other kids might be like sponges where they absorb everything around them. But um, let's be very wise to our words and kind of our words. But all that said is that I'm glad they're able to like at least find out that Maybe all of those things were not, were not necessarily true about you, but you could empower yourself through your words and, you know, seize that narrative and write your own poetry and, you know, share your work with the world. So could just to you on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I know one of the... I, I can't remember the first time I ever met you. I knew you were my junior in pharmacy school. And the only interaction I remember about you was on Body Thomas. I don't know if you remember that day. I used to work in a pharmacy and I saw you just across the street and I might even take this part out, but you gave me a hug and I think you told me you're maybe going to study. It was, was we doing something regarding economics or something. Oh yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And you gave me a hug and we had a, a short conversation and I, I didn't hear about you from many, many years, but I know that one of, if I remember was that you almost always kept to yourself and perhaps one of the things that, 
because I remember asking some, I, I don't know how your conversation came about. And the person said, oh, that, you know, very shy. It wasn't shy, like, not shy, but it said in the way that, oh, she doesn't talk to people. So I imagine that maybe some of the things people might think about you is, you know, not being they probably friendly. probably call her a snob. A snob, which yeah. Shy, which you, was shy people tend to get yeah, called. Yeah, do you get that a lot? And, yes, how does that, how, have you, I'm sure you've heard that many times, you know. Ironically, absolutely not. Like, this was... <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it let's hear it give it to okay. us let's hear it okay so what happened with that like when i got into medilag for some reason i cannot like explain or take credit for i became extremely popular so i was friends with like almost all the heads of all i the remember these parts <laughs> you know <laughs> i was friends with lots of people because i smile a lot so because i smile a lot i'm kind of approachable you know so I met lots of people. I was friends with lots of people. Although, like, I didn't form close friendships with them. But, like, they knew who Jennifer was. And they knew, oh, she's friendly. She's nice and all that. So, when Lidwell even came in, like, a year after me, all our classmates loved me. I was like, no, they're my classmates. <laughs> you know? So, I it was the opposite for me, especially in the early years, 200, 300 level. And then on my 21st birthday... What happened is that I kind of had like, you know, this party in my room. So lots of people should come and all that. But my roommates knew me as the girl who always stays in on a bed on the top bunk. You know, she never goes out. She doesn't work on me. No one comes to visit without nothing. So when I said I was having my birthday, they didn't really expect like anybody to come. Because who does she know, you know? Then by the time I come back like from home with the food and all that to to school. And um, my sister, the last one, she was in secondary school then, and she came. And the entire floor was filled with people from all departments. That was the irony. I was in pharmacy, but I was friends with everybody, like, from all departments. <laughs> from all departments, from, like, all fellowships. Just different people. And, like, my floor was filled. The next floor, people were just hanging around. And my roommate was like, how do they know her? How does she know anybody? And when my sister goes home, she tells my dad, Jennifer is so popular. And it was like, what? No, she's a quiet person. Why is she popular? <laughs> so that was the irony of my life. It was oh, quite okay. the opposite. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad, you know, yours is different. And thanks for jogging my memory on that. I was wondering, I was just wondering what, um, I, I know you said you don't know how it happened. Yeah. But I'm sure you thought about it and I'm sure you have some, some theories. And I'd like to hear what those theories are. The only thing I could think responsible for that was that maybe I just felt maybe because I smiled a lot and was like if I saw someone, even if I'd never met them and maybe they just kind of looked friendly as in in a way like trying to say oh hello, like my face would always give a smile to them and they felt welcome. So and I went like when I first came, I went to different fellowships trying to figure out where I belong. So but when I got there, I became friends with the pastor so like all the pastors in the fellowship knew me and it was just weird i i don't know like i don't i really do not know what to attribute that to honestly yeah <laughs> okay um my question was gonna be this for you so i know was it early uh, early 2000 sometime i think 2008 2000 and between 2007 and no 2008 and 2012 you had to speak in your um, your poetry. I mean, Facebook was kind of changing from notes to like, you know, ha- that you could hang out with people. And I just remember it just blowing a lot. And you had, I remember there was a, an event you held in Lagos. I wasn't in Nigeria then, but I, I was following you on Facebook so I could watch where you had like your poetry readings, you, your books were, you know, being sold. I think that was when, was it Calligraphy of God or the very first one, you know, it came out. And and then you went quiet for a few, you know, years. So I'm just curious to know, how have you been able to manage those seasons of peaks and valleys? Because right now I feel like you've, you've been quiet for a while, but maybe just writing in the background. And now with your third book coming up, like I see you doing more stuff on, you know, on social media. <laughs> but I, I, those those moments, I feel like the valleys, I'm really curious about the valleys because I go through that as well as a creative. Is How have you been able to handle just the the fame that comes with the 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 peaks and then the I won't call it depression but let's just call it depression as a way that comes with the valleys and those you know those two times and was this intentional for you? 
Um, yeah, sometimes like, okay, so the first one you mentioned, that was my first book. So that was Carcast. For some reason, I, I do not know why, but like you mentioned, my poetry kind of just blew on social media. And uh, at some point I noticed like, then I was still in Nigeria and I noticed most of my following was from outside Nigeria, you know? And I was like, okay, why? <laughs> you know, I didn't know why. And, and this was for Instagram, by the way, or hashtag. So yeah. FYI, <laughs> this girl, she's been to places, okay? Put some respect on it, okay? <laughs> It was just so crazy, you know. And I, I was like, the irony was that Skakas is probably, this is how I'll describe this, my three books. Skakas could be my purest work because what happened was that I wrote Skakas, I like to describe it this way, like I wrote Skakas sitting down in the depths of hell. I was going through hell in my life and in that darkness and lostness and everything, I just kept writing, writing. Just So it was as if the writing could save me. So I was saving myself through writing. And when I was writing, I wasn't planning to publish or anything. I was just writing for myself to save myself, my sanity and all that. Then, but I had gathered so much work, you know, body of work. And people were like, you have to get published, you know. So that was when Oscar Cast came. So I still believe it's one of my purest work. But in terms of my best work, I would attribute that to the calligraphy of God. So the space between Skakas and the calligraphy of God is about two years. Skakas was launched in December 20, um, no, April 2014, then calligraphy of God, December 2016. It's about two years. So those, like you mentioned, the, the down period, I usually do it on purpose. So I try as much as possible. I call it hibernating. So once there's this old big noise and all that, eventually I always want to go back into my shell, you know, because that's where I feel most comfortable. And um, when I go back into my shell, I try to rediscover myself because it's easy to get lost in the noise, the fame, the, oh, I love your work and things like that. But I want to, all my life remain kind of a pure, true artist. So I want to focus on the art. So that two years of depression most of the time, I don't write at all. I don't post any work on social media. I just live my day-to-day -day life. Then at some point, I start writing. And that's when the next book comes out. So. For those that are wondering, Skarkas is, you know, her very first book, and she called it Anthology of Jenim DBA. And I think there was a point you changed your name on Facebook to Skarkas DBA, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> so it's a collection of, um, of, of poems with themes on love, life, death, God, the past, the present, the future. It's a, a blend of experimental and modern poetry. And again, like she said earlier on, it's born from a place of pain to heal the pain. And she's just, you know, just having a way to express herself through poetry and thanks for um, answering that and i think for you since you said is is a deliberate way to kind of hibernate but i imagine that having to i don't know i don't know how you you're good with dealing with fame because i don't take no, i don't even have fame like i'm not anywhere near as famous as you are but the, and i think for me it's quite deliberate is why i don't just do things just for the sake of wanting to be pop, become popular even the little popularity i have it messes me up in my mind because I don't think mm -hmm. I, I haven't reached that emotional maturity to handle it. There's a way he wants me to just want to keep over performing in a way that robs me from my creative purpose. So I'm a little bit, I, go, I, want, I always want to go against the grain when it comes to that. And I still don't know how I'm going to work around that. I mean, you don't have to diagnose this issue, okay? It's still a working problem for me. And I don't need your saying that. But, well, anyways. I, I was going to say, I was, I was actually going to say something about the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term micro famous. Tell me about that. Mm -mm, I haven't heard of it before. So, um, I may not be defining it as best. As like only famous with people could, that you know. <laughs> but sort of, fam no, well, famous within a small group of people, but mm -hmm. not famous to everybody. And yeah. it's like sort of the ideal of famous for creatives and especially mm -hmm. for introverted creatives because it's like, it's like where this level where if you go to like many cities globally, you will find someone who knows you that yeah. you've not met that you can meet up with and have coffee. Yeah. You know, so it's like this sort of nice, like, oh, who's who's here? You know, who's who's in London? Who's in New okay. York? Okay, I think I'm that way because I have people in. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, I think I might. Yeah, but 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 like not like 
enough that it's affecting your privacy in any yeah. significant yeah. way or anything. Yeah. 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 Okay. True. That's a good way of saying it. Thank you for that. I'll own that. <laughs> But 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 I was gonna ask, uh, Jenny. I was gonna ask um, you. So, one of the themes in your work is faith. Mm-hmm. It's um, and and I and I know from. I I know from conversations we had, because I know we talked about this back in uni, years and years and years ago. I don't know if you remember, mm-hmm. um, and I know from some of your work that I've read over time that is something that you know some of your work is obviously someone is 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 it's visible wrestling with faith right mm-hmm. um and 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 I, I guess what I wanted to ask is um if well one if you could talk a bit about that like in what ways in what ways are you wrestling with faith right now? If that's something you want to talk about, because I know that might be super personal, Ooh, and that's, that's fine a, if you don't want to talk about it. That's a good question. Please that's answer it, um, <laughs> And, well, okay, let, let me ask that one first. That in what ways are you wrestling with faith right now? Or or if you're not wrestling at all, yeah. uh, what was the last wrestling you had? And what did you come to after it? I immediately turned into the real rumble. <laughs> <laughs> In the blue corner. <laughs> Undertaker and Jake the Snake. She's definitely in the red corner. You, you guys can't see her, but she's wearing... DDT slab. <laughs> sorry. Oh, my God. I so, Lani, you're going to be in the blue corner because you're actually... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. So it's black, by the way. Are you colorblind? <laughs> I might be. Oh sorry. God. Sorry. Please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, let's see. Uh... Wow, I've had quite a journey with God. Um, wow, it's been like ups, down, ups, down, mostly down, 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 then up, 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 down. It's been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been crazy. It's been a roller coaster ride. Uh, so let's see. I'll just start from the start. Uh, I was born into a Christian family, and um, my mom is like, I don't know if God was like he just got it like he got it if God was in person like she would be like God's brother and sister or something like they would just be uh, she's just like oh I love for God is so inspiring she has had a lifelong affair with God and um so I was born into that kind of family and my dad was also a Christian, but not the way my mom was, but, you know, and um, so we grew up going to church. We grew up, for some reason, all of us, we just kind of love God. And so we're all kind of very active in church, different departments. Sometimes I'll be like in four or five departments at the same time, choir, dance, Sunday school, usher. <laughs> so whatever I could do, I just wanted to do because I love doing it and I just kind of love God. But so by the time I get to college, that's where my life kind of started taking a detour. Um, so a lot happened to me in Medilag. And um, 2009 was kind of the peak of it all. And when that happened, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do with my life. I felt God had failed me. I blamed it all on God, you know. So I just, because I was praying a lot and hoping a lot and, you know, needing kind of God to just kind of do some miracles to save me and stop some things that were about to happen to me, but it never worked. And so when there was an eventual breakdown, I, I blamed it all on God. And at that point, I just said, like, I'm done. I don't want to be, I don't do anything, you know, anything related to God. Just cut me out, you know, I'm done. And in... 2011, I actually like said it like definitively. Like, I kind of said, like, God, just leave me alone. Now, it's not like I don't believe in God or I believe in God. I'm just kind of agnostic on the fence. Whatever the situation is, day or day. Just, <laughs> exactly. Just, I don't care. Just leave me alone, you know. And I just stayed on the fence and I stayed that way. Interestingly, normally in the past, if I say kind of like, God, leave me alone, I still kind of feel his presence around me. Well, from that 2011 to like 20, to last year, 
I never felt that. I don't know. I don't want to go all too spiritual, but like I never felt that presence of God in my life anymore. And um, uh, it was it was horrible. And um, mm. so at the point, I moved from agnostic to atheist. So like, okay, I, I don't even believe in the existence of God. And I started like trying to find out. Okay, so all these people that do not believe in God, that means they, they must have like some knowledge, you know. Let me go to science and you know, let me find out, you know. And I went in and I tried to watch videos on YouTube and read books, you know. And I discovered like they didn't have the answer either. I was like, you know, so I just went back to my agnostic self. <laughs> so, but last year I had a conversation with my brother, and I think he just mentioned something like um, he didn't know like all the struggles that I had with my faith. He just mentioned something like, um, "What has God ever done to anyone? You know, or to you? All he's ever tried to do was to love humanity and to love us. You know, and we ate him for it, kind of. And when he said that, it just kind of broke my heart. Like after the call, I wept for like." But I kept it really straight, you know, and that was in October. And since October till now, I've been back to God and our relationship has been flourishing. <laughs> and it's been so beautiful and good to be back. And in my writing, like you said, you would always see it's a, a story of someone struggling, you know, with faith, with what to believe, you know. And sometimes the poems are kind of targeted at God. You see. <laughs> Sometimes I write a poem. Once my friend sees it, she will she just tell me it. I know what's going on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you pull up, started again. Oh my god! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just <What>? crazy. <clears throat> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just, I just, but I, I mean, when you say, to, to be honest, I, I feel like, you know, the, the I was going to say the Bible, but really, a lot of Christian. A lot of the writing by Christians, a lot of the f- religious writing by Christians, mm. has been wrestling with with faith, isn't it? Yes, like, Lewis, I yeah. think, I think, I think. I'm not. I mean, so even taking the Bible, right? Like you have the Book of Job, that's supposed to yeah. be the oldest, sort of the earliest written book, and then Revelation is the last written book, and Job mm-hmm. is literally wrestling with the question of what is going on and where exactly are you and what are you doing and what is all this mm. about. Mm-hmm. And then Revelation ends with, you know, saying, saying how long, you know, before you do something about everything. And so it's like, you have these sort of bookmarks, you know, the first book to be written and the last book to be written. And they're, yeah. they're, they're both exploring the same issue. And literally mm-hmm. everything in between is, is wrestling, right? Is, mm-hmm. you know, Israel means wrestling with God. And that's yeah. the name that you hear the most <laughs> frequently, apart from God's name himself. So it's yeah. like the name of these people is basically wrestled with God. Oh <laughs> True. You know, and, yeah. and it just goes on like that. And of course, it goes on right. You know, it's like that's just the story of of faith, I think. Mm-hmm. Um so I, I basically all, all this to say, I think you're a really good company. <laughs> I think so too. And as you're even talking, I was even checking out some of the things because I've had similar experience. I think you know, you and I have talked about that as well. I think yeah. until you get to that point where you, I, I had to just shed away a version of Christianity that I knew that was kind of messing with my mind, and I felt it didn't really, you know, um, serve me purpose. And I think it came, and I'm not trying to um, take away from this is the fact that growing up in a Christian home, sometimes you tend to forget just how valuable that is. And yeah. moving to the US was when I realized that man, I don't think I'm that much of a person of faith. And so I've had my come to Jesus moments, and I'm but I'm glad that you found you found your path, right? And there's something me and I mean talk about how Christianity is like a map, you know. At the end of the day, we're all gonna get to where we're gonna get, get into, but we might take a detour or maybe Apple Maps might tell us to go through the river to get to where we're going, but we shall get there, shall we can turn yeah. left by the river or turn you know right by and I remember if you didn't catch that, I was trying to diss, you know, Apple Maps because it said someone to turn, you know, left by the river. You, you <laughs> spot it by pointing to it. Because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't respond, which I, that was going to be my payback. I was not least... dignifying it. <laughs> Is what that was. <laughs> Now, um, this next question, I've been thinking about a way to ask it. 
but I, I guess since we're talking about faith, I, I just want to ask, it might get a little bit dark, um, just the way it's asked, but if I have to rephrase it, let me know. And if you don't want to answer it, that's okay as well. So in looking at some of the, the people you're inspired by, so you mentioned like, I know Charles um, Bocoxi is one, Sylvia Plath, and um, is it the point? Is it Point Dexter Christian? I don't. I don't remember his first name. <laughs> yeah, Christopher yeah, yeah. Poindexter. Christopher Christopher Point Dexter. Um, yeah. Charles Bukowski. <laughs> and I, I know there was a video myself and I immediately shared. Um, I mean, his when you talk about you know transgressive um, fiction, um, antisocial, nihilistic, and you know just the one that really points out the mundane aspect of ordinary life. That's you know Charles um, um, Bukowski, and I can definitely see why someone like Sylvia Plath. I mean, she's like the queen of confessional poetry. How that yes. inspired you? But the community within these two people where they kind of I would say succumb to their own artwork in a way that the darkness took over them taking you know for example Sylvia Plath has really she had a lot of mental health issues which if you pick up any of her poetry she was very open about talking about it and yep. the way she even ended up killing herself it was just you know in a very very deliberate almost like total eradication way I guess my question is given that a lot of the the things you talk about are some of the dark points you've had in your life and there's a way sometimes it's, it's comfortable because that's what you're used to right how how are you doing in such a way you don't succumb to you know a quote unquote the demons that you're trying to unleash through your writing? Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, I'll just start from the two poets, so Charles Bukowski and Sylvia Plath. They are kind of so different in terms of their personality. She's a Definitely. white girl, yeah. you know, young, beautiful, smart, and all that. Then Bukowski is like a, an old drunk, doesn't care. <laughs> no cusses and does whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> dirty realism. That was his, 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 he's known as the father of dirty realism. But... Yes, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. When I, so I, like I mentioned earlier, I studied the other poets, you know, John Keats, the you know, the big names, the good names, Robert Frost, right, and all yeah, these mm-hmm. prof, yeah, the yeah. proper poets. Then American approved. <laughs> yes. American schools approved, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they kind of, in quotes, perfect for us. So yes, 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 yes. And then all of a sudden, I stumble on this free radical, you know? <laughs> I'm like, what is this? You know, <laughs> his poetry was just like all over the place. You know, he was just saying what he was thinking, typing what he was thinking, as he was drinking and whatever else he was doing. I'm like, oh my God. Then I said, I read so much of his poems and wow, it's actually very brilliant. And I was like, wow, his work is one of kind of the most honest. He never denied what he was or what he was struggling with. He he never, I love the raw honesty of his work. He never tried to, how do I put it? Sugarcoat it. Yeah, Yeah. he never tried to sugarcoat his reality, you know, and all that. And his poem, I think one of his best poems I love is called Bluebird. So oh yeah, about, that's oh one my god! One. Yes. Oh. There's a there's a there's a YouTube video of it uh, where he kind of narrates it. His voice is something that I'm glad oh, that we have it forever yeah. etched into the you know walls of internet. I mean, remember yeah. that video right that we kind of talked about. His voice is just. But go ahead. Sorry. I remember the video. Was that yeah. his, as I recall, that wasn't his voice though. Was no, they it? they they took elements. There was of the two. Poem. There's yes. two videos where. There's, so unfortunately for me, I think I heard the one where someone spoke in, read it first, and so I liked that one first, and then I discovered uh, it was in his voice, and by then I'd fallen in love with the other voice. No, his <laughs> voice. Yeah, is, you can you can actually it hear does the have whiskey. A distinct voice. You can hear the whiskey coming out of his words. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of like Leonard Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen. Voice, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. All right, so I love Bluebird, so because I completely kind of understood it, even trying to like drown that. Um, the, the Bluebird is kind of the truth, like it's conscience, so it tells him maybe what it's doing is wrong, it drinks and drowns the bird. But when he goes to sleep at night, you know, the bird still stays, you know, maybe like you can be a better person or you're more than this. And so I, I just really love that poem, I, and he wrote like a lot of poems, and I really love them. And I stumbled upon Sylvia Plath. At the time of my life, I found Sylvia Plath. Our stories were really similar. I was so scared. I was like, oh my God, you know? 
And then I read a word, she's one of the most brilliant poets ever. And I think she died at the age of 30 or something like that in a 30. 43, I think. Yeah. 43, uh-huh. So Sorry, no, 30, 30. She died in 1963, sorry. She was 30, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, and you know, so, and uh, our work is brilliant. And I think there's, um, I have a book of us, the, a published journal, you know. So I wrote the things that were happening to her. She was just writing, she goes on a date, she writes with and all that. And her life was kind of really tortured. And I could relate to her in a lot of ways. And I kind of connected to her story. But <clears throat> in terms of, um they like you said unleashing the demons what happens is there's something um there's a quote by charles Bukowski that says if you take away a writer's typewriter or pen what you have left is the sickness that made him write in the first place there's something that drives people to creativity there's something that drives yeah there's something that drives people to art there's something that drives them there if my I, i'm not speaking like i know i'm generalizing now but like um if my life was kind of perfect and good and jolly and happy i most likely would never have needed to write but the intensity of my struggles led me to seeking salvation somewhere and i was just lucky to find writing it was almost like <laughs> i don't know it was almost like a, a gift, like maybe I was drowning and someone just dropped their life to us and said, okay, this could save you. And writing was it. Now, um, like I mentioned, when writing Scarcast, I had to unless a lot of that darkness, depression, sadness. When I wrote The Calligraphy of Gold, it was less so. It was more about me trying to describe the artistry of God in terms of love, the trees and all that. So there's a lot of imagery of nature and all that. But... This my new book is my lightest book. <laughs> in quote, in quote it's I could tell from the cover. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me confess here: I've not been able to pick up your two other books because oh it was too real for me. But this one, I'm like, okay, I, I, that's why I said I wanted a signed copy. You know, I've, I've read bits and pieces. I've read, you know, some pieces of your old books, but I've not read. I've not like had a whole copy of it. I've read poems from, you know, here and there. But yeah, but go ahead. I, I, I I agree with you. I think it's your lightest yeah. book. <laughs> like it was so, I was like, it was so good that I was like, I had to double check. I was like, I'm sure there's something wrong with my talents here. I don't have my talents anymore. <laughs> I was like, I had to send like samples to some people to review because like, I've not written since. So my second book came out in 2016. This is about six years later. And so I wrote it like November, December, 2021. And yeah. I was like, I'm not sure about my talent anymore. Before when I write, I was quite confident in the quality of my work. But with this one, I was kind of, I just kind of reconnected with God and I was in a good place. I'd gone through an extremely rough year where I'd lost my job and for most of the year, I didn't have a source of income. So things were extremely tough. So but still, in the toughness and the difficulty of last year, my head was above the water. I was stable. I was calm. That's the most... <laughs> mature or responsible have <laughs> been all my life yeah. you know? <laughs> and so my when i connected to go by silver in november i wrote this book it was just kind of light yes it still deals like with my the death of my dad a little bit about one or two poems about him but overall it's light and beautiful and um because it's light and beautiful i'm kind of scared like am i losing my talent am i losing my skills you know because when I'm sitting like in the darkness of it and trying to write from, it's way easier to write from sadness than from happiness. You know, it's way easier to write when you're depressed than when you're joyful. Yeah. And my brother has always had that fear for me. It was like, do not let the darkness consume you in, you know, in the process of um, creating, do not let your creation destroy you, you know. And I have that fear. I I would just say this, like, um, I suffered from depression all my life. All my life. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all my life. So that's why I said I could relate to Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. So, and the thing about depression is that you kind of live in fear of yourself. You know, you live, yeah, you live in fear of yourself. It's almost like, oh, you know, the person you're most scared of is yourself. You're your worst enemy. And um, 
So because of that, I needed to find a way because I discovered that a lot of things that were happening to me, I felt that then when it was happening, it was unique to me. It was just me. The world hated me. Life hated me. I mean, but over time, <laughs> through reading of books and studying the Bible and other things, I discovered it's more universal than I think. And that's why through my writing, I try to create light for other people. I think there's a quote I wrote that said, um, all I wanted was to plant poetry in broken places and watch flowers grow. Basically, when I write, I'm trying to shine the light to people. And surprisingly, there are many people out there who could be going through something either similar to me or different, but something they could see they're not alone. They could see they can make it out. They can see someone else has gone through it or is going through it and is making it out, you know. And my goal with writing at the end of the day is to shine the light. Wow. Uh, I mean, yeah. thank you for answering that. I I dare to say that we won't have how to dance in time without first having <laughs> scar cast and calligraphy of God. And a way to think about it is that life is, you know, it comes in phases and this is just a, I don't think of it like a less serious poetry. It's still you. The commonality is you. <laughs> I think it's just showing the processes you've gone through in the past six years. And I'm glad you're in a place to at least still keep writing yeah. and, it just shows the current phase you're in, and I hope it's, you know, sustained as long as possible. I also want to make a slight correction. When I talked about Sylvia Plath and Charles Bukowski, they're two different poets, but I kind of, the way I talked about their death, it made it seem like Charles, you know, committed suicide as well. No, he died of leukemia. But Sylvia did, you know, kill herself in a very horrible way. But yeah, I just wanted to make that um, distinguishing, distinguishing facts, you know, clear. Yeah. I I I um I found interesting the bit where you talked about um the fear of of not being able to create if you sort of almost like lost your pain as it were mm-hmm. um not your words I'm paraphrasing obviously I'm not saying yeah. it as well as it did um <laughs> I I, fi- I find that interesting actually because I think um there is there is um I think there can be a danger of sort of romanticizing pain in a way which i think um, those of us who are more creative can fall into yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean um, yeah. um and and i and i and and, and and something that it brought to mind was this um so there's this set of essays by this really brilliant lady um don't know if you ever read her dorothy says She's fiery and she's amazing and she's, oh, she's great. But anyway, one of the things she talked about, there's this essay she wrote about um, a play she wrote because she, she also wrote plays. Um, she wrote the Lord Peter, the Lord Peter Whimsy Detective um, series, which was very popular in the UK a long time ago. Um, and there was this plays that, there was this other plays that she wrote and one of them, there was a character of the devil. It was a play that was sort of Pardon the pun. It was a play on Faust, the mm-hmm. the um the the myth of you know Faust, the guy who sold his his soul so, for knowledge, yeah. um, or knowledge and power, um. And one thing she said was that actually what she's found is that it's easier to write the devil in a, in a story than to write an angel. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something I never really thought about. And the point of what she was trying to make is that. It's easier to write bad guys. And actually, you see it in a lot of stories, right? Yeah. One of the hardest things in that many writers face is writing a good hero. Because the, it's easy to make the hero unrealistic and boring and uninteresting. And I think one of the things people then think as a result of that is actually heroes are uninteresting and being good is uninteresting. But one of the things she pointed out is no, it's easier to write the bad guys because we're more familiar with being bad guys. Mm. And the reason why it's harder to write good heroes is that we're not so familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. true. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the reason why it rings untrue because, well, it is. <laughs> right? 
It's so and, true. And, 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 and you know, her point was like that actually when you see the every now and then you read some stories and i've seen a few stories i can't remember any now moment, unfortunately um but when you read some stories where people de- describe i mean a good example is when c.s lewis talks about aslan right in crunks and uh, he says and you know and that fa- that very popular bit where lucy asks is he safe <laughs> it's not lucy or lucy or, or uh, i think it was sarah or, or susan sorry um mm. And and then they say safe. Whoever said anything about safe, but he's good, <laughs> right? That's mm. something about the nature of God mm. that is very clear in Scripture, but you don't easily see in literature because not many people have gotten to grasp that, right? Because you don't get that if you're trying to sanitize Scripture, if you're trying to sanitize faith. Do you mm. get what I mean? Um, yeah. And I think that's the thing with writing good characters as well. But but I think that that also comes down to even things like the idea that art can come from joy. Mm. You know, and art can mm. come from happiness. Right? Yeah. Because of course it can. It can. <laughs> and I agree with you. Have you watched the TV show Ted Lasso? The yes, yes, so yes. Beautiful. That is, that is an example. That is a yes. bit, actually, you know, you're so right. I can't believe I do, but that is a... That is a beautiful, but that's Absolutely. kind of that's kind of goodness that you can't mm. write if you yes. haven't known it. Yes. You can't, you can't make you know. And I think what happens a lot of people try to write goodness mm. based on what they think goodness should be, mm. but you can't, you can't really do that. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh my god, absolutely, and like. When I first watched the last, I was like, are you kidding me? Who is this optimistic? <laughs> Who is this kind? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but it's so brilliant. And it was such an inspiring show. Like, so many people's lives changed from that show. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and, okay. and the thing, I don't know if you see the second season. Yes, but the I thing have. that the second season really highlights is he's the way he is because he chooses not because he's naive not Mm. because he's foolish not because he doesn't know better but because he makes a choice to respond to reality in a certain way and that's a choice any of us can make well it's hard and it's not easy but it's not easy for him either and then in in season two you see some of the pain and some of the the you know i don't want i don't want to say too much because i don't want to spoil it for people (laughs) but but and i know tolani hasn't seen it but but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Without like, I think if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I mean? absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you realize this is not like some naive, you mm. know, sort of sappy, you know, childlike, you know, hasn't really matured and known the real world kind of. This is somebody that's seen things. Yes, yeah, a lot. <laughs> you know that that. Thank you for that. That's, that is such a great example, actually. That's put that on my queue of things to watch. Oh, you would love it. How come you never told me? Well, she does have a problem. <laughs> you, there's a good reason why you haven't watched it. What's the problem? Just take a wild guess. Wait, is it on <laughs> Apple TV? <laughs> Can we move on from this conversation? Thank you. <laughs> I refuse to be corrupted. Oh we try. We tried. Jenny, we no tried. Yeah, no one does. No one does. How did it, how did it escape we from tried. my black hole of knowledge? It's why you don't know the kind of battles God is fighting for you. This is one of the reasons. Yeah, oh we God. tried. We tried. We tried to spare you. Thank God. Oh, but, thank God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from all of it. Oh my God. Moving on. Yes. I, I I wanted to ask a question though. Um, okay. And and yes, it is. This is this is moving on. Um. Well, kind of moving on. It's 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 connected in a way, but it's not so much about faith. Um, okay. It's it's basically has to do with you know the the um. So you've talked about you know you've you've you faced the pain, you faced the joy, um, mm-hmm. and now you're writing from from joy. What, mm-hmm. what have you? How is it different? How is this this different? Mm-hmm. The current, the current writing, how has it been different for you? Okay, it's been different because, uh, let's see, it's more difficult to write. So, oh. yeah, way more difficult. 
I used to shun out poems. Like, I know I've written over a thousand poems, but I don't want to exaggerate. So that's why I put 500 poems. So, but, uh, but yeah. Give me this kind of modesty. I'm telling you. <laughs> I will add <adding> extra zeros. <laughs> I mean, more like the modesty of. I know, your, I know. Your, your modest is 500. I could never. I could never be. <laughs> that couldn't be me. <laughs> Oh my lord! You know, I've been writing. That's like that's like the literal equivalent of. I'm just going to throw a few million at this. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do a billion. But um, now that I'm kind of in a lighter, happy place, um, the writing comes like kind of fewer. I think something has to change because when I was in a dark place, I was writing out of passion. So. You know, they said, they say you have to have passion, love what you do, and all that. So I was writing out of passion. But now that I'm in a happy place, I'm now coming to realization that I have to now write out of discipline and determination, as, as well as passion, but but more responsibly. So I I can tell you for certain, I have not unnessed my talent up to even 5%. Because everything, everything, like what happens is, Calligraphy of God, I wrote it, I think, in maybe like a day or two days. I just go in, I start writing, 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 stop. I have so many poems. But I don't, I'm not the kind of writer that writes like every day or every week or whatever. So I, I've never had that discipline and, you know, needed to be an artist. So, but now that I'm in a happy place and I'm not writing from depression or sadness or things happening in my life, I now have to combine passion with responsibility determination and just discipline you know and um <clears throat> yeah so that's where i am um when i used to write the darker poems um people always said okay even though the poems were dark at the end there was always kind of a glimmer of hope at some point they were just dark all the way but now they're all up, up all the way <laughs> light 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 and I'm like, oh my God, who is this person? Who wrote this book? You know, it's completely different. And sometimes it scares me because not writing from pain, it kind of um, makes me kind of doubt my capabilities and my talent, you know. So that confidence I always had, I never needed approval or validation for my work. I knew when I finished this poem, you know, before I put it out there, I always had this confidence and knowledge that it was good and well, you know, taken care of. But now, um, when I finish a poem, even though it's good, I just, I'm like, oh my God, is it good enough? I'll send it to, to another poet or a friend or my sister. Oh, please help me read this. It's a good poem, you know, before I put it out there. So I think it's kind of affected my confidence, but I'm just at the beginning of this you know, side of the journey. And I think with time, I probably would find my way and a way to, you know, balance it out. I'm sorry that I mean, they would like this new version of you because for him, <laughs> he, is like, you have to like, don't show up. That's why he, he always says no. But yeah. I'm so of looking at it is like, the right time in you is still, it's still there. It's just, yeah, almost like committing yourself more to it. It's still a different mm. side of you coming out, but it's still you regardless. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, the yeah. way I think of it is, there's the art of writing and everybody focuses on that mm. too easily. And we forget that writing is also a craft. Yes. yes. And, and this is the craft. The craft is you show up and you do the work, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and that's what I'm hearing you say. Um, yes. and, and it makes me think of the fact that like, you know, again, the idea of art as this sort of romantic <clears throat> thing that people only do when they're moved by the muse is is a mm. recent thing like yes. historically all through human history artists were workers mm. <laughs> right a lot of what we call art a lot of what we call art it's kind of of the the <laughs> it was it was people's jobs and they did it to commission no, 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 yeah. you and you and you produced on demand <laughs> hence the hungry hungry artists because you don't work you don't eat literally <laughs> true true <laughs> But yeah, thank, thanks for thanks for sharing that. That's that's um, um and and yeah, I'm 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 glad you're I'm glad you're in this place. And I don't know what's gonna come next because, like you said, life is in waves. Annoyingly, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 
I, I, I think in some ways it can't go up, but it doesn't go up in a straight line. It still goes. It goes. But we don't know if it's up or down. It still goes. In some ways, it's higher. It's lower lows and higher highs in some yeah. ways sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Very true. I like to I like to spend some time on your new book, you know, how to dance in time, and okay. I think you describe it as a, a book that contains poems to encourage people to find themselves. You also have, you know, the things you usually talk about: grave depression, um, falling in love, being in love, and all that. Mm-hmm. And but the, the commonality is, is still a confessional style poetry. Mm-hmm. I guess um, what has that. We already kind of have an idea of what your writing process has been like, but for anyone that picks up the book, what would you hope for them to, you know, pick out of that book? And yeah, okay. So I think the the, the shortest and most effective way to describe the book is Carpe Diem, seize the day. So this book was kind of written to remind people that life is short. Um, sometimes we we are kind of we feel kind of entitled, thinking, okay, since I was born, I'm going to live like 100 years or 120 years or something. But sometimes people die before they are born or they die young or, you know, like Jesus died, I think, at the age of 33 or something like that. And he had, done ev- yeah, he had done everything he was meant to do in his life and it was over. So we have no rights to time. We have no entitlements to time. We have no, you know... Today might be it, but like if today is it, have you done what you were born to do? You know, so this book is just kind of telling you whatever it is you want to do with your life, you know, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't, um, okay, in 10 years, I'm going to leave <laughs> by the house, um, the house by the sea with my 10 dogs and all that. But like, um, since the day when I was young, I for some reason was a strong believer that. Every single person had a talent. If it, was, if it wasn't singing or playing an instrument or something, I just believe, I was, and I was firm about it and vocal about it, that every single person had a talent. There was something that they alone like were exceptionally good at. So like I mentioned, I've done dancing, I've done singing, and I've done all that. But when it comes to poetry... That's where I'm exceptionally good at. That's where my strength shows. That's where my talent lies. So, and I mentioned earlier, in spite of writing maybe over a thousand poems, I've still not amassed half of the gifts God has given me because it's so easy for me. In my sleep, like I could be in the shower, a poem comes, I'll leave the shower, take a pen, write it down so I don't forget, then go back. You know, I'll be sleeping. A poem comes, I wake up, type it on my phone, go back. I'll be praying and maybe just creating a song to God. And it's so good. I'm like, oh God, let me remember when after praying. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. So it's just there. So for me, in my sleep, I can write to a kitas poem and all that. So that is of it. That's where the talent comes in. But the executing of your gift, the using of like the total gift and potential in you now comes from discipline. So like I already mentioned, showing up and doing the job, showing up and doing the job. So some people don't even like in quotes have talent, but they train themselves to be way better than people with the actual talent. So whatever it is like you like to do or you want to do with your life this book is just kind of reminding you to seize the day carpe diem love to the best of your ability today live to the best of your ability today use your talent to the best of your ability today it's all about kind of today and it's kind of encouraging people to like live richly and fully and deeply like that's what this book is about I, I hope you are even even though you've given us something to like think about. I hope you're also enjoying the season you are in. You know? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. And where can people find the book? By the way. Oh, yeah. It's on Amazon.com, and now it's just been um, published in Nigeria, so it should be all over. Yeah. Look 
at you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh I thought you were... <laughs> It's, see, this is why if I don't see your face, it's hard for me to emote. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about my video being gone. You better be. Just kidding. Go ahead. No, I thought you were going to ask a question. I just realized that you were quiet, and I wondered if you were waiting for me. Oh, waiting for you. Because well, I had another question, but I wanted to give you a thing, Yeah, go so. for it. Oh, um, so, we've done a lot on your book, on your creative process, and I... I think you've had so many things you've you've talked about, and I just wanted to emphasize one thing, which is um, it's also something myself and I really talk about a lot. In well, I don't even I don't know if you are the one I talked to this about. Like right, I'm praising kids about being smart, praise them more for putting their effort into something, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you said about writing. It's, it's like just putting in your effort, and it seems like this is your book this time around is about you. Because someone might say that yeah, pain is kind of like an easier place to write from now that the pain is gone it's like your muse is gone like now what now right no. what you gonna write now you know i like charles yeah. now the cooks will say don't try you know that's one of the things he always said don't try if it doesn't yeah. come to you you should never try to write don't try just write um but let's talk a little bit about something that we've explored on the show before but i'd like to hear your angle on this so i know for a fact that you you're an immigrant to the u.s you moved here um is that something you like for us to talk about Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. I wasn't sure if maybe your fans and you are not in, the, in Nigeria anymore. <laughs> but you've been you've been gone for so long. At this point, it's like spoiler. We don't have to ensure like a spoiler alert. Um, just given how you tend to be, uh, I'll say introvertish, right? My question mm-hmm. is, how have you been able to find community where you are, and what was the hardest thing for you to adjust to the US? Oh wow. So I came here in 2018 for my master's in business. So the town I came to is called Corvallis in Oregon. And it's like maybe 99.9% white. <laughs> you know? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> So no crazy. offense to white people, uh, <laughs> but we like diverse communities for immigrants. It helps us. I, I know. It was so like, oh my God. But the good part was that they were very friendly. Like they helped me, you know, carry my bus from the bus. And like, Do you need help? And stuff like that. It's a very friendly community. And uh, in my class, I was the only black person myself, <laughs> you know. So I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, so I just always kind of kept quietly to myself sitting in front and yeah but it was a good experience and uh the first thing I missed the most was the food I was like oh my god no more general fries <laughs> and you know panda jam and those food. are real <laughs> issues <laughs> I know and there was no single African store in Kavali you know, I was like for two years I didn't eat any African food and it was it was tough you know and uh what else the cold. Ah, I used to work like in this cold diner. So I used to work early in the morning. So I would have to work like in the snow, walk to work and shivering cold. It was terrible. And um, it was just a year after I lost my dad. I lost my dad in 2017 and I came here in 2018. And I didn't kind of uh, properly process the loss. Then when I came here, that was when I processed it. I found myself crying a lot and just, you know, going through it. Then in terms of community, um, I kind of made friends, a lot of friends in school. Just, okay, I would say acquaintances. I just, I socialized and made acquaintances. Then when I graduated in 2020 and moved here to Portland, um, it was in the middle of the pandemic, so I wasn't able to meet people or create a community and all that. And uh, the worst part, like you already know, was this year, just in March, I felt terribly ill and needed emergency surgery, and I had absolutely no one. It was so frightening, and because of your help, of course, I was. some people came to meet me. It, it was the most frightening experience of my life. Like, when they were putting me into surgery, I was like, Dad, see you soon. I thought I was going to die. You know, I was like, that seems to nobody to like hold my hand or just say it will be okay or something. It was, it was cold and tough. But since I've gotten better, I've put in more effort into meeting people. So now through church, I've met about 
three new girlfriends and <laughs> we went out one Friday and I think we're going out tonight also <laughs> just to explore the city, have dinner and stuff. Is that I'm Jennifer? To... Jennifer is not yet. We're meeting soon. <laughs> so we're going okay. for dinner soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so these are yeah. other people from church and okay, it's good. been amazing. And a daily also. Yeah, she best, my <laughs> yes, she was, they were both amazing to me and really, really good. And, uh, so yeah, and now I'm putting in more effort to creating a community, meeting people and having someone to depend on. Oh, I'm so happy to hear. I, I do, well, <laughs> since you mentioned it. So in our episode where we talked about super, superpowers and communities, I had mentioned helping to find, help a friend, you know, find community and reaching out to people on social media. Well, it was Jennifer. So, but I'm glad that really helped worked out for you. And, you know, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. So shout out to everyone who helped out. Jennifer, okay. even Jessica, Jessica Puri, um, I immediately actually was one of the people that helped us get a doctor to come, that works in that hospital to come oh. say hi. We shared Thank just you. a story on um, FGM oh, and wow. how work on that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm glad you. that you found you found your people from there because as you know, <laughs> you shouldn't do life alone and, yeah. you know, yeah. Anyways, um, thank you, thank you, oh, guys. No. thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. It's, it, I, I mean, that I see there are two parts of you where if I go on, if I didn't know you, and I just look at your social media pages and things you've done, I almost like I know Jennifer, but I there's also Jenny in DBA, which is like. Oh, the Jen in DBA. And <laughs> you're so humble about the whole thing. I mean, we, we kind of teach you about the whole 500, you know, points and all that. It's, so take it like, it's really a privilege to be able to share your story and, and bring you on the podcast. And my, my time on GSA is probably your first time ever being on any podcast, right? <laughs> Look at that, guys. See the things we do for you people. So go listen to this episode and share with your people because this is Jennifer DB. But um, seriously, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, doing this with us. Thank you for opening up about just you know, what your process has been like and the faces you've had through all of your work. Um, I'm glad to see this version. You know, we don't know what 10 years down the line is going to be, but I know that it's a work in progress, you know, and it should always get better. It will only get better. And yeah. So thank you on behalf of everyone on the show. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know is ours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, Perhaps if you have anything you'd like to say before we close out the show, maybe things we haven't, like if there are any burning final, no final words, I mean, they'll come for me that when Nigerians on this podcast, you know, there are three Nigerians on this, on this episode. It was a non Nigerian, they would let us like, ah, it's not my final word in Jesus' name. So I can't even say I'm in this face. So let's imagine that he's rolling his eyes right now. So are there any final uh, comments you'd like to add to this ongoing poll of conversation? Yeah, so I would just like to, first of all, thank you so much and everyone um, listening, you know, for this opportunity to come on here and just share my story and just, you know, talk about the book and my poetry. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. And then I would just like to say that um, no matter what you go through, no matter how difficult life may get sometimes, never give up, you know. Um, at some point in your life, it might seem like, you know, you're in the, what do you call it, the proverbial tunnel, you know, where it seems like maybe there's no light at the end, but there's always light at the end, and there's always hope, you know, and from the things we discussed today, we talked about love, we talked about um, faith and hope, and I think the Bible says the greatest of the three is love, so if you can love as much as you can, you know, give as much as you can of yourself, of your time, of your resources, you know, and also give yourself a break. <laughs> Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on other people. Everyone is kind of on a journey. And if you believe in God and have faith in God, then trust in God that you'll end up somehow, some way in a very good place. And I hope when you read my book, you'll learn how to dance in time and seize the day and love deeply, live deeply, and I wish you the very best. 
Whoa. <laughs> you know what? Permit me, I mean, this is okay. I was that actually thought of something. Yeah, that was beautiful. The first person to send us a message on Instagram about this particular point in time, like make sure you mention this timestamp. You're gonna get a free book of Jennifer's um crown, a free copy of Jennifer's latest book. We'll send that to you. So you have to mention this particular timestamp. And the key word is dancing in time. <laughs> <laughs> or how to dance in time just so mention those two things the timestamp and this keyword and you're gonna get a free copy of it it can be shipped to you anywhere in the world but yeah um, I think you've you've ended us in a very good way I mean we can't even add anything to it because that was beautiful. and today's Friday I don't even have to go to church on Sunday because <laughs> I'm all filled up. Oh my god. Anyways, well, um, thank you. I think we said that many times, thank but thank you. you. And I hope this was not as never acting as you thought it was gonna be, but thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. All right. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, we hope to catch you guys on another episode of the More Silver Podcast. Don't forget to listen and um stream, download, share with people, tag your friends. And yeah, let us know how best we can also support you as well on the show. If you have other topics you'd love for us to explore, you know, hit us up on Instagram or through email or Facebook. Just find us. We're everywhere, you know. And as always, we'll catch you guys on another episode of the Most of the Podcast. This is Mo and I am today. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. My goodness.